University College of Washington University, and KETC, the St. Louis Educational Television Station, present a course for television. The Religions of Man with Dr. Houston Smith, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Washington University. One of the striking things about Buddha and his whole approach to the problem of life is the intensely practical, really scientific way in which he goes about his problem. So much so, in fact, that even if we disagree with his solution, uh, we of the modern temperament can appreciate the approach that he uses. Really, as these words suggest, it's essentially the approach of a physician, of a doctor. We begin with symptoms. What are the symptoms? If there are none, then there's no problem. You can go your way, no point in sticking around. Actually, however, the symptoms with regard to the problem Buddha faced are all around. Suffering. Suffering is the symptom. And life is pervaded with this suffering. From the shock which birth produces right on down through disease, through decrepitude of the old age, to death in the end. Life is pervaded with the symptoms of suffering. Let me just read to you the way Buddha put it in one of his passages. How, he asked, how is there laughter? How is there joy as the world is always burning? Why do ye not seek a light, ye who are surrounded by darkness? This body is wasted, full of sickness and frail. This heap of corruption breaks into pieces. Life indeed ends in death. I show you only two things. I show you suffering, and I show you the end of suffering. The symptoms, then, of suffering are all around. And this, then, drives us to probe, to see if we can't discover the cause of the symptoms. It drives us to diagnose. It. Is there a source of infection which is causing these symptoms? And Buddha says, yes, there is. The cause of suffering is the drive in man for private fulfillment. It's because we want to be an ego. It's because we want to pull ourselves out, separate from the rest of life. It's because we like to cut off the circulation in life by widening the distance between ourselves and our fellow men through our wealth, through our prestige, through innumerable other devices. It's because the tendrils of life which ought to be extending outward into the lives of others become in turn and thereby ingrown. It's because of this drive, this powerful drive towards ego fulfillment. This, Buddha says, is the cause of the suffering which beleaguer life from birth to death. Well, if this be the diagnosis, what is the prognosis? Is it fatal? Is it incurable? 
No, said Buddha, it's not. And this takes him on to the third of his four noble truths. If the cause of suffering lies in this drive for private fulfillment, the cure of suffering and what could be more logical lies in the overcoming of this egocentric drive in life. Well, many might have left it right there, but Buddha was nothing if not practical. He would never rest with a generalization if he could possibly carry it down into specifics. And here he felt he could. If the overcoming of suffering lies in the overcoming of the drive towards egoism, how is this to be accomplished? And you see, there is a point certainly no less important to, than the others. Because many would say, yes, I do want to get rid of this private drive. I, I do find it true that I'm always trying to give my heart away if not to a man or a woman or a child, then to a cause. And when I do succeed in lifting myself out of my private obsession, it's then that I find myself happy and with a sense of power and fulfillment. But the trouble is that my heart comes back to myself so often. How then are we to accomplish this self-transcendence? And that is the point which we consider this evening. What is the treatment which will accomplish this cure? Buddha then moved into the famous eightfold path, the way to overcome the sufferings of life. This is a course of treatment, but it's not, and we must get this straight at the start, it's not passive this is not salvation by pill. Uh, this is not even salvation by belief, though as we'll see, beliefs are going to come into the picture very soon. It's not salvation by grace, though before a hundred years are out, grace too is going to come flooding into Buddhism. This is not salvation by momentary ecstatic emotional experience. No, this is salvation by self-effort, salvation by hard work. What we have before us here is a graded course of spiritual exercises which has to be practiced incessantly, diligently, throughout a lifetime if one is going to accomplish their end. It's very strange in life. We take it for granted that in all the details of life, we'll get nowhere unless we practice, unless we really work at it. I have students that want to become football players, basketball stars, and I find them out on the playing fields every afternoon, rain or shine, they're out there working at it. Or they want to be concert pianists. And again, they pour their lives, realizing that there's no chance of getting anywhere unless they really give the hours, the time, the effort. But somehow in life, when it comes to life, we somehow assume that here there's nothing really much that we can do about it but drift and sit back. Well, Buddha felt just the opposite. We forget the supreme business, training for the business of life itself. And this is what he is leading us into such a training in the Eightfold Path. As he says in one place, happiness he who seeks may win if he practice the seeking. Now, what does this practice involve? Eight steps. But first of all, there is the a preliminary step, not included in the eight, but really referred to so many times that Buddha really presupposed it. This preliminary step is right association. We are, as Aristotle realized, we are social animals, deeply influenced by those who are around about us. The only way to train an elephant, I've heard, is to chain this elephant to another elephant. Because only then can the wild elephant realize that what he is being set to is training for a new way of life, rather than simply the 
arbitrary frustration of every natural impulse. We have to see that this new way of life is endurable and does work and leads to a way of life which he hadn't realized. It's no different in human beings. Encouragement is needed in every difficult enterprise. A kind of transfusion of courage from others who are trying to live according to the way in which we are. So Buddha says, you'll never do this if you just try it by yourself. You need the company of the holy. Seek out then those who are really already beginning and have advanced in this way. Now, with this preliminary step, we go into the Eightfold Path proper, and he begins with, first, right knowledge. Every religion is more than belief, but it's also true that every religion invo involves beliefs of some kind. We need a map to give us a sense of orientation, a sense of where we're going. I don't know why my mind uh, uh, is going, turning to examples of elephants uh, this evening. I guess maybe it's because we're dealing with, with India. But I've also, I also understand that if an elephant is in a place, however dangerous, suppose the barn is burning, the building is burning, and you want to lead him out, he will not budge from his spot until he has tested the track which he is to follow. Only if he finds it firm and that receives his confidence will he then take a step. And if he doesn't have that confidence, he'll stay and he'll rope, he'll burn to death rather than commit his weight to something he is not convinced will support him. Man is the same way. If there ever be any doubt, shadow of a doubt, that this be somehow, this way of life, be foolishness, be hollow, end up in nothing, this will vitiate all effort. Right knowledge, then, is the first step, and this involves the Four Noble Truths, which we considered last time and noted in passing, the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the cure of suffering, and the way to the overcoming of suffering. These one must believe in for the rest to make sense. Now, right knowledge, then, is the first step. But this is followed by right aspiration. You have to make up your mind, Buddha says, what you really want in life. Most of us never quite do that. We want a multitude of things, and so we're distracted. But there are men, there are men in the world of affairs who want, who are intensely interested in one thing, and they go about their days doing a thousand things, but in the background always is this one supreme thing which affects everything else that they do. So it must be with us. Only when we really want this way will we advance in it. The story is told of the man who said, how can I reach God? This is an Indian story. And the teacher took him to the Ganges and pushed his head under water and held it there for about a minute. And finally, he let the man come up and said, how did it feel? And the man said, terrible. I thought I was going to drown. And the teacher said, when you come to the point where you really want God as much as you wanted air during those seconds, then you'll make some progress towards finding The second step is right resolve. Make up your mind. Don't vacillate uh, day to day, but set your course and keep to it. The third stage, third step, is right speech. Here Buddha is beginning to reach down and take hold of some of the deep underlying switches which control our character. And speech is the first one. He comes to this before he comes to action, and I think he's probably wise in doing so. We probably do have more control over our speech than over our other behavior. Now, what should be our goal here? Two things to bring our speech, first of all, in accord with truth, and second, in accord with charity. Now, why? Why is this so important? Why was Buddha a stickler for truth? Not for any moralistic reason, not because it's naughty or bad to lie. No. 
is because lying deceit introduces artificiality in life. When you lie, what are you doing? Really, you're trying to protect something within you which is false. And that builds up a false light that gives it new life and swells this false light within you. Truth then gears us in with reality. It makes us more real people. And that fundamentally is why it is important. The second is also important, and that is charity. How much of our language during the day has charity within it? How much, on the contrary, is filled with backbiting, uh, slander? If not obviously running other people down, then subtly running them down by, by uh, oh, damning with faint praise is one very neat way. There is something in art called the mezzo tint, where you have the relief which you want to stand out, do so by carving away the background. Now, how much of our lives, how much of our language is really a kind of process of whittling down the other people around us so we will stand out by contrast as exalted. Right speech in the direction of truth and charity. And Buddha says an interesting thing here. He says, first of all, watch your language and realize to what extent you do engage in deceit and uncharity. And then when you come to that realization, then you can make some progress in overcoming. Now, the third step was right speech. The fourth step is right behavior. Now we've passed beyond the verbal level down into our actual overt responses. And what does right behavior consist of? Well, the most important, lots of things, we won't have time for them all, but most important here are the five precepts. Listen to them. You will recognize them. They're so familiar. They come, are paralleled almost exactly in our own Ten Commandments. Not kill, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be unchaste. And a last one which we don't happen to have, but he added, thou shalt not drink intoxicating liquors. This comes because Buddha was very keen on alertness, mindfulness, and anything which would dull this awareness he was opposed to. The only thing I think we need to add here is that not killing is not confined, not murdering, is not confined to the human species. As you know, of course, the Buddhists are vegetarian, and they feel that this slaughter of life for our own needs, this produces a kind of callousness. They're really more in accord with Schweitzer's reverence for all life on this point. That is the fourth step, right behavior. Next, right livelihood, right vocation. Again, the practical, the psychologist in Buddha is coming right to the fore. Because what Buddha is saying, really, is that more than half of our waking lives is, are involved in our occupation, in our vocation. This is what we think about during our waking moment. Now, you can't spend more than half of your life in a certain area without that area having a profound influence on your own character. The hand of the dyer, the hand of the dyer is subdued in the dye with which he works. And so it is also with our own occupation. So, Buddha says, if your vocation is something which requires of you a kind of emphasis which is counter to the direction you want to move in your spiritual development, if it ever comes to this kind of a showdown, this kind of a tension, there's no question which is going to win. Your vocation is going to pull harder than your, your offhand spiritual aspiration because you're involved in it so much. To this end, then, Buddha insisted there are certain vocations which are incompatible with the spiritual life. Some of these seem very obvious to us. Some have a sort of quaint ring. Uh, he, for example, uh, included, well, such things uh, as a thief, as an assassin, 
uh, a poison peddler is one of the forbidden occupations. Uh, a brothel manager would be another one. Then there are some that sound, of course, foreign to us, a weapons maker and a butcher. These two were out. But more important than what vocations were out is the principle itself. And of course, one of the intriguing questions is to apply this to our modern life. What would Buddha have said about our vocation? Which one would he have felt might be not too amenable to spiritual development? Right livelihood is the fifth stage. The sixth stage is right effort. This, as we said at the start, is a way of self-effort. And everything in the final analysis comes down to willpower, the slow, dull heave of the wit. And so he counsels his people to be vigilant always and to slack not till they attain the goal. He uses the image of an ox who is treading through the mire. He's tired, he's weary, but he knows that if he ever stops, he will start slipping down and will not be able to get out. So he keeps putting one foot in front of the other. So too Buddha ends with this life. It is a quagmire in its own way. And there's only one way through it, and that is to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Right effort, then, is the sixth step. The seventh step is right mindfulness. Buddha counsels here an intense alertness, a strenuous vigilance. Always we should try, as he puts it, to see things as they really are, see our situation where, it, where we actually are, analyze constantly what's going on in our minds and in our bodies. It's very close, really, to the psychoanalysis in this sense, because one of his statements, here it is, to understand something is to be delivered of it. Isn't this one of the basic principles on which psychoanalysis proceeds today? So, says Buddha, we should constantly be aware of what is in us, what are the situations we face, so that we can come to this understanding which brings relief. Now, this calls for practice, constant practice, too. Most of us, Buddha says, our lives resemble that of a sort of a longish doze, interrupted by fitful starts of semi-wakefulness. But Buddha, we must never forget, Buddha means the man who woke up. And this step counsels this eternal vigilance and awareness. Now, finally, the whole path culminates in right meditation. This is not easy, this final capstone. Not easy for us to understand because it draws on the Hindu yogas, which we have seen before in our series, and it seeks to reach a new form of experience, a kind of experience which involves the revelation of what life ultimately is and may become. It's hard for us to understand this. Only in our mystics do we have a comparable path, a comparable uh, point, really, in the spiritual life. But though this is difficult to understand, we must accept it. We must at least take it seriously. Because if we try to reduce this, or water it down, or say, well, the rest is very practical, but this begins to get obscure. If we leave this out of the picture, we fail to understand the power of Buddhism over the souls of men. Something happened to Buddha under that bow tree. This we must never forget. And something has happened to every Buddha who has actually attained enlightenment. Something which it's true, we can't put it into words. Words fail and are inadequate. And in the end, only those who have experienced something like this can comprehend what Buddha is talking about at this point. But though we have difficulty, 
in actually laying hold of what it is. We can take their words about the kind of five qualities it produces. It produces the surrounding quality of peace, they say, of peace, of deep freedom, of joy, and of insight such that uh, eye hath not seen nor ear heard. Well, it's not intellectual in any ordinary sense. It's a kind of immediate insight. It's a kind of revelation of deep. But this is the final state to which the four, the eightfold path works its final way. Well, this uh, is Buddha's eightfold path. We've covered it very rapidly, inadequately, but enough perhaps, I would hope, to cause you to look deeper into this on your own. The question it leaves us with, of course, the final question is whether this works. And on that point, why, I think there are a couple of things to say. First of all, there is not the shadow of a doubt, but that Buddha himself felt that this worked. He was absolutely convinced of that fact. And yet with all his convictions, he, he was nevertheless reluctant to ground his message in authority. Not only reluctant, he was as clear as he could possibly be in deliberately refusing to ground his message in authority, even his own authority. We tend to think so often of the Asians in terms of masses, as a group. But here is an Asian who speaks to the individual directly, to each individual man and woman. And what he says to them, well, listen to what he says. Do not ye go by hearsay nor by what is handed down by others, nor by the authority of your traditional teaching. Do not go by what other people say. Do not go even by what I say. Accept, O oh disciples, nothing but what you yourself discover to be true. Work out your own salvation with diligence. Religions of Man is produced by Washington University and KETC Channel 9, the St. Louis Educational Television Station and Production Center. This is National Educational Television.